Hello everyone, this is Artemis with the Uncivilized Podcast, and today we're doing a book review. So before we get into the book review, I wanted to give a couple of updates, is that PIU3, Plastic in Utero, my zine that I publish through Uncivilized Distro, is now for sale, and then PIU4 is now accepting submissions. The topic for uh, PIU4, uh, and we, I will accept things that are outside of the themes, but they're more suggestions to kind of have some like, you know, some cohesion is tactics strategy and criticism of of those in the past so if you want to criticize like oh this is why the 60 failed or this is why you know wto failed this is the failure of anarchist strategy strategic thinking generally right things like that if you're interested at all in submitting uh i will have information about that in the description and then going forward we're actually going to start uh publishing uh an audiobook version of Ma uh, manic hardy's uh free from civilization and it's being produced by someone who's a, a fan of the podcast and is someone who, who follows us and I, i'm really excited because the, the the reading quality is amazing the book from i have not read the full thing but is absolutely awesome uh, john zirzan wrote a preface to it uh and john has talked about it before on anarchy radio and i i'm very excited to kind of expand on civilized to to accommodate that uh, we're thinking right now that there are several parts that have been submitted to us, but what we'll probably do is put those parts together and have a smaller amount of uploads, but significantly longer and put them into a playlist that can make uh, accessing that book a little bit easier for those who want an audiobook. Uh, and when we get closer to that, we'll we'll announce it. But this might be this will be in the near future, sometime this summer, so when those start going up. Today's book is called "Facing Toward the Dawn: The Italian Anarchists of New London" by Richard Lindsay. This book uh, came to my attention actually through a previous episode we did at the time of recording this about a month ago. Uh, the episode was called The Galleonisti with Dr. In Dr. Andrew Hoyt. Uh, Hoyt kind of gave some different book recommendations and referred to academics and scholars that do similar work to his. And this book was one that he he highly recommended. And I, I'm, ex I'm extremely glad that I read it. I mean, just off the off the bat when I when when I saw the cover of it when I was looking it up, it's that this really cool design with different, you know, kind of laid in the back or layered in, I guess you could say, the Chronica Subversiva, Mother Earth, and some like uh, some different articles and headers from different anarchist journals that were important to the community of, of New London. And just the way it's the whole layout, the book is beautiful. I mean, some of these books, admittedly, when they come out of uh, publishers this is the state university uh, in albany of uh, new york and albany uh, state university of new york press albany is, is what i meant to say sometimes the books uh, for whatever reason I'm, I'm never always quite happy with those layouts and i, I could be a little i don't know judge a book by its cover type so when i saw this i, I was i was pretty happy with it uh yeah so i'll, I'll hop to the back here and i'll, I'll read you know the, the the text on the back in the early 20th century, the Italian-American radical movement thrived in industrial cities throughout the United States, including New York, London, Connecticut. Facing Toward the Dawn tells the history of vibrant anarchist movement that existed in New London's Fort Trumbull neighborhood for 70 years. Compromised of immigrants from the Marsh region of Italy, especially the city of Fano, Fort Trumbull anarchists fostered a solidarity subculture based on mutual aid and challenged the reigning forces of capitalism, the state, and organized religion. They began as a circle within the ideological camp of Erico Malatesta and evolved into the one of the core groupings within the wing of the movement supporting Luigi Galliani. Their manifold activities ranged from disseminating propaganda to participating in the labor movement. They fought fascists in the streets, held countless social events such as festas, theatrical performances, picnics and dances, and hosted militant speakers, including Emma Goldman. Focusing on rank and file militants, carpenters, stonemasons, fishermen, housewives, Rather than well known figures, Richard Lindsay offers a micro history of an ethnic radical group during the heyday of labor radicalism in the United States. He also places that history in the context of the larger radical movement, the Italian American community, in the greater American society, as a move from the Gilded Age to the New Deal and beyond. Uh, and Richard Lindsay is described on the back of this text as an independent scholar who was heavily involved in the labor movement and the political left for many years product of lifelong interest in labor labor and radical history this is his first book so that's something I want to speak to and this is kind of a disclaimer for this episode previous episodes and episodes in the future uh, it's in, it's interesting so I'm deeply critical 
of academia, obviously, it's not this neutral institution of learn, you know, learning and knowledge, right? It is an institution connected to capitalism, the military industrial complex, or just the, the commodification of knowledge itself. Uh, and I've written before for Oak, this upcoming Oak, number six, kind of this criticism of allowing scholars into her spaces. And I'm sure, you know, there's tension and contradiction that I, you know, I've platformed academics, I read academic works. And unfortunately, that's kind of the nature of a lot of the work on anarchist history is unfortunately centered in academia, right? And so there is tension there. And people have mentioned it to me before, so I want to, like, acknowledge that. But it's also to the regard, like, the work can be talked about, but we can also be critical of, like, the context of it. And then we'll speak too much to that, uh, just to, to center on the text itself. Uh, so, yeah, um, getting back into the book, like I said, amazing cover design, very well uh design generally speaking and what i find uh most important about this book is as it says in the back kind of this micro history um that it that it doesn't center it's not a book about erica malatesta emma goldman or galliani no it's about the people that did the work right not to say those people didn't do work obviously they did and they did important work and that's why they're so well known but these are the people that kind of do the, the right it says the, the rank and file and so there's two quotes just before the beginning of the book here that i want to read that kind of establishes kind of the tone and for any you know pronunciation issues right uh, i'm i can admit i butcher a lot of shit so sometimes i'm just going to translate things into english that's just kind of the nature of it so one opening quote is we work for the emancipation of the proletariat for the coming of a free society in accordance with our weak forces, but without weakness and compromise. Today, as with tomorrow, and with equal, if not better, activity in our door, we have no other ambitions. This is the group of the future. Uh, this was a submission they made to the Subversive Chronicle or the Chronica Subversiva. And then under that is a is kind of a interview slash interrogation of a member of the, the New London Anarchist Movement by the B, the B, the BI, the Bureau of Investigation, which is kind of like the precursor to the FBI. Do you believe in anarchy? I believe in all which is good. Do you believe that the government of any country should be overthrown by force? That depends on what kind of position they are in. Do you believe that the government of the United States should be overthrown by force? I never tried it. Are you an internationalist or a nationalist? I am a citizen of the world. You don't regard yourself as a citizen of Italy? I like every, everybody in the whole world. I just, first of all, that inner, like, there's a couple of those in this book, and it's kind of the wit and, and, and kind of the playing that these, some of these anarchists are participating in when they're being interrogated or pushed to kind of incriminate themselves. Um, I just find some of that stuff kind of enjoyable. And I have to say, too, I'm kind of jumping ahead to a, a, a later note, and I will say, talking about books that are not theory, right, these kind of history books, I find are a little bit harder to review. Uh, theory, that like you can get into the idea he is, but then to talk about history, you have to jump around a little bit more. So this one might be a little bit more messy and a little bit all over the place. But you know, I th I hope that's you know, it is what it is, right? Like, what I was going to say is that that Lindsay actually has a has quite a bit of uh, of wit. He he's a he, admittedly he's a he's a funny guy. He's funny. There's there's a moment in this book where he 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 quotes or will make jokes. Um, there's a moment I remember where he uh he's talking about moonshining right or kind of the prohibition era and that this this one italian american you know anarchist is is around these spiritualists right that kind of 18th 19th century movement um and they make a joke that they call the police on him or they report him because they don't like his spirits right like referencing his alcohol and just that that kind of the wit like that i find can help a book be a little less dry and i will say for me, I'm not sure, you know, I had a lot going on when I was reading this book, that the first half of the book, it's interesting, and I enjoy it. Maybe not even so much the first half, but maybe the first quarter or third. Yeah, definitely the first quarter or third is a little bit more, for whatever reason, I find it to be a little bit more dry, maybe because it's it throws a lot of names at you, and it's kind of like setting the scene for like some of the bigger things that happen later on. Not so much in the narrative, right, because this is real, like the history, right, so... You know that's just kind of like my preference and you know if you get through it i, I think the, the the book overall is generally really enjoyable and it's not that dry and again and lindsay helps by 
by being very human, right, he doesn't do this cold, observant perspective that some people think is, like, necessary when you discuss history. Uh, something that also stood out to me is that this, like, you know, we described as having this relationship to radical, radical labor and, and the political left. Um, but his grandfather was actually a subscriber to Chronica Subversiva Organ, the Subversive Chronicle, which was an outlet of, like, Italian, Italian-American or generally Italian anti-organizational anarchism. He also found like kind of an interest, his early interest in Italian American history for the Sacco Vanzetti by Paul Average, which is a book. Paul Average, by the way, is an author just fucking outstanding. And I, I recommend everyone uh, read his work. Uh, and the preface to this is kind of the, the, the Fort Trumbull again, being kind of this specific neighborhood in, in New London, Connecticut, and dealing with the issue of like eminent domain, um, right, where the government can kind of just, for lack of a better word, take over shit. Um, he centers that in the Italian drama uh, center, uh, this issue of, of that they can just kind of take whatever and they want to take this historic building, or excuse me, the Italian Dramatic Club, not Italian Dramatic Center, Italian Dramatic Club or IDC Hall. And that there's this this case of eminent domain and it went to courts kell over the city of new london and it kind of centers like this is what's happening with that city or what has happened right and kind of uses the idc which was founded by this group of you know, ghani and sd so to speak this italian american uh, anarchist grouping that idc was like a like a center or a hall for them and so he kind of begins the book uh, with that and then kind of gets into his own history uh, his relationship to to the political left and, and, and anarchism and so the reason I, I mentioned this stuff is that it's really nice that he doesn't i guess make it that these anarchists are what i find in history books or a history of anarchism by non-anarchists is it's very easy to be like oh they're just mindless and, you know, they're mindless terrorists that have no aims. They use social pressure to justify their sociopathic bullshit, right? It's either that or in the cases, of, especially with things like Emma Goldman and Sacco and Vanzetti, is that these are just like helpless victims who were simply scapegoats of like American nativism, right? And they're just looking for people to oppress. Obviously, there is a relationship by the fact that these are, you know, generally foreigners. Emma Goldman being uh, Eastern European and, and Jewish. And then uh, Sacro and Vanzetti being Italian, right? Like there is the way these cases are handled, particularly Sacro and Vanzetti, a big part of it is their identity, right? But this also infantilizes them by removing that they that these are people that acted out of out of strong beliefs. Both of them are kind of rooted in the idea that they don't have beliefs, that they're either one is a victim or the other is a, you know, perspective is they're victims or victimizers, that there's nothing to be said about what they believed. Uh, and I would say Lindsay does not do that at all, which is, you know, uh, given that this book was recommended and had some uh, reviews by even like political outlets like Counterpunch, who reviewed this book very positively. And I'm not a Counterpunch fan by, by any means, but I think it's still important to say in Counterpunch, I'll, I'll just read their review. Lindsay's cultural and political history of New London anarchists is a valuable addition to the history of U.S. radicalism, simultaneously local and international in its scope. Facing toward the dawn broadens the reader's understanding of early 20th century immigrant life in the United States while adding some important context to the popular history of resistance to American capitalism. And with this idea of national and local at the same time is this transnational perspective that I find is actually a growing trend in anarchist studies. And in fact, it reminded me of a book I read recently called The Anarchist Inquisition. Assassins, Activists, and Martyrs in Spain and France by Mark Bray. He's the, you might know that name from, he's like the, he wrote Antifa, the anti-fascist handbook. This idea of, of transnationalism, um, it is a, as is like this network and relationship between local, excuse me, local and, and, uh, and global international networks, or in this case of, Lindsay, kind of the movement and relationship or like nodes uh, of networking, I think is maybe how I would express it, even if if Lindsay wouldn't put it that way. Right. And so this idea of transnationalism uh, is is I'll read the note that I had here uh, connects to the growing trend in anarchist studies, transnationalism, which in short 
uh, tries to understand these anarchist currents as beyond more than that within a nation, but crossing several boundaries. For example, one cannot understand the new London anarchist scene without first understanding their Italian heritage. And as the author notes, that they were in communication with those back home, but struggled primarily in their own city and neighborhood. The book goes to show New London has, in comparison to some towns, a more permanent nature, but migrants still pass through and travel back to the homeland, uh, which is something he brings up later. But again, this transnational idea that seems to be, you know, I don't follow academic anarchist studies or anything like that, but the fact that I read two books almost back to back that seem to focus on that I don't know, lens, I guess, um, I just found interesting. I appreciate it a lot. Again, like, it's not oh, this is Italian anarchism, like these are national anarchisms, that anarchism is a transnational movement. It's connected, regardless of boundaries, these are internationalists, generally. I mean, there are some that, you know, they preach internationalism, behave in nationalistic ways, but whatever, right? And point being is that it's, it, it, it reminds us that you can't understand New London Connecticut anarchism without understanding the anarchism of their homeland, even you know, even years after many of them haven't even seen their homeland in, in years. So again, that just, I think, is a, a really a, a effective and a, I appreciate it is what I'm trying to get at here. And there's also uh, something to Lindsay's credit is that in the first couple pages in the introduction is that he actually provides a concise, maybe... And I would say it's a self-aware, oversimplified history of anarchism and kind of the development of the ideas from like Proudhon as this kind of non-radical market socialist to, to you know, Raccoonin and Kropotkin and things like that and the anti-authoritarian or Black international, right? And the, it, it works really, really well. And I thought that was, again, it's a, I can appreciate that's what it, it, it that's what it hopes to do, right? Is that centering that these people have values and that's why they act the way that they do so i if it helps people trying to you know i'll try to convince some people to read this book obviously I, i'll quote a few basic principles of the anarchist movement can be stated although at heavy risk of oversimplification the core of the revolutionary anarchist doctrine are several elements that distinguish it from marxist or excuse me marxism on which social democratic parties of the late 19th century base themselves Anarchism places the role of the individual as crucial for revolutionary activity that proceeds from there to engagement with the masses. The anarchist movement rejected social democratic prioritization of parliamentary activity and instead focused on their, their efforts on building a revolution from below, involving sections of the working class outside of the existing trade unions. Anarchists stood as anti-authoritarians, and while some supported the forming of anti anarchist-led organizations, they criticized professional revolutionaries for attempting the dream leadership of the working class. They did not seek to replace the bourgeois state with a worker state, as they regarded all government authority as inherently oppressive and corrupt. In the anarchist vision, a social revolution of the working masses would quickly bring about a society based on self-directing associations of the populace. Um, and it goes on to quote uh, Sacco from the case, uh, saying, no government, no police, no judges, no bosses, no authority, autonomous groups of people, the people own everything, work in cooperation, distribute by needs, equality, justice, comradeship, love each other. And then goes on to quote Kropotkin and a couple others and references their ideas. So obviously that's a bend towards, for lack of a word, like left-wing anarchism, right? But for what we're talking about, like the specific grouping of anarchists we're talking about, I think that's an extraordinarily accurate definition for someone that's not an anarchist. So I can appreciate that a lot. And so... I'm not going to go over like the history of this group because that's the point of the book. Um, but I mean, it gets into the the kind of the conflict between organizationalists and anti-organizationalists. And the one thing that sticks out to me is that Lindsay very obviously skews towards solidarity or sympathy with the organizationalists, the Malatesta, like anarcho-socialist types. Um, and so he gives a lot more time kind of defining organizationalism and giving examples, but not um, not so much the anti-organizationalists. And he tends to show the anti-organizationalists, which, to be fair, I think is fairly accurate, is kind of the sectarian movement that didn't want anything to do with those that didn't ascribe to like their, their particular understanding of anarchism. And that's my understanding of that particular movement, though, you know, that's not always the case for every member of that movement. And he actually believes... Uh, toward the end of the book, I think it's the last couple of pages, kind of talks about 
uh, could this movement in Connecticut, particularly New London and the areas around it, could they have done more had they not been so sectarian, had they bought into and stayed with, right, primarily staying with because they did develop within this current of kind of Malatesta, but, and he seems to conflate Malatesta with syndicalism, that could be, I'm misreading it, which is strange because Malatesta, he was sympathetic to trade union work, but he was not, a, he was very openly not a syndicalist, uh, what he calls the Patterson idea, right, and so I say Malatesta and seemingly the IWW, uh, and he believes they would have had a stronger impact that way. But then also goes on to say that they did have an impact, right? Like they go on, there's moments, right? Like with the rise of Mussolini, there is a strong fascist sympathetic movement in the Italian American population or the Italian like diaspora. And a lot of that, I appreciate he does this. He connects that rise of fascist sympathy to, or I should say diaspora, whatever, um, that he connects it to uh, this nativist attitude towards italian italian immigrants and italian americans uh, and, and i appreciate that it's not that just people were just oh they're italian so they're going to believe whatever the italian government's doing it's you no know, like they're being you know discriminated against and harassed so it's like naturally they're trying to find something that can embolden their own existing identity and so i, I again Lindsay, uh not not or he's not sim oversimplifying and when he does oversimplify he's very aware of it and he states it but in the case of like why fascism tries to take a hold among the italian american community i think it, it, it that adds a context i never i personally never thought of because that's not much attention i've ever given to that subject before and so while he does seemingly skew towards this organizationalist perspective he doesn't say well they didn't do anything right these anti-organizationalists they still did good work and i can appreciate that uh, for those that are maybe wondering about kind of this what does the conflict between fascism and anarchism look like in fucking connecticut it's I think it's great. Like he talks about, like they are very clear. Like they they jump, they jump these uh these uh Italian American fascists at different rallies. This Christopher Columbus rally and things like that. And at one point, in a uh, and a fascist is found dead in the water. And it's very obvious. It was very clearly probably the anarchists, right? And so, um, I find that to be really interesting as well. And then other conflicts that occur are both internal and external right both the, like this kind of sectarianism and ideological arguments but also these more moderate groupings that begin to form that are very much seemingly pushing for like assimilation of italian americans into uh the dominant american society kind of you know generally this kind of whiteness um other areas of relationship that they come under pressure uh, which is something that i've only begun to kind of appreciate since the dr hoyt interview is the relationship of prohibition to to the italian american community and i don't know what that looks like to the wider anarchist community but these people you know who's they are they if the men are in prison or they die or they're back in italy right a lot of these people that are engaging in in like the the illegal production of alcohol tend to be women and they need to provide for themselves and it is this idea of you know where they're trying to sell like liquor licenses and the only those that can afford it can have it right and so then it's also like a class issue and it's a really interesting like relationship between prohibition and anarchism that up until very recently i was not aware of and seeing that reinforced here i thought was pretty great so uh, it focuses on two this to the kind of this anarchist grouping i'm talking about starts as both the group of the future and the group of the free and those are obviously translated because i'm not going to attempt to, to absolutely fuck up this pronunciations um but yeah, so, I mean, I will leave it there. I mean, I mean, I know this is kind of a, a all over the place review. It's not super professional. I have notes that are just all over the place because the book also jumps. It's not always totally linear. Like they'll refer back to events and it moves back and forth, but it does generally kind of follow a, a, a narrative. And the contents for this are from Fano to New London, Italian revolutionaries in the Yankee state, the birth of the group of the future, the night at the opera house toward Galeanism, breakdown, rebuilding, solidarity neighborhood, anarchists at war, faced in the 1920s, they fought the law, the 12th of October in New London, allies and enemies, from the New Deal to World War, and tested by attacks of times and illness, and then a conclusion. So that's 15 chapters followed by a conclusion. Uh, 
Uh, the book is just about if not including the notes or the, the the photos that are in kind of the middle of the book, the illustrations or yeah, the illustrations and photographs. It's 242 pages, um, numbered pages. And of course, I always love when there's, you know, halfway through the book, you have photos, parts, some of which are from Fano or, or Italy and others are from New Connecticut, New, uh, excuse me, New London, Connecticut, and even some figures of that were involved. And just seeing these people, you look at them, you're like, you know, like, I don't know these people. These aren't Malatesta. They're not Berkman. They're not Galliani. So it's interesting to look at them and be like, these are anarchists that most people don't know. But these are human beings that have a history, had relationships and struggled for the, the, the ideal of anarchism. Right. And it's not an anarchism I identify with, but it's an anarchism that I acknowledge and respect. Right. And so I'll leave the review there. Um, I will have a link to where you can order the book. Uh, Again, this book, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I had to put it down. And part of the reason it's this book, this this review isn't as organized as some of my others are, is that I got caught up in the, the encampment that I talked about in the previous episode. And that this book kind of had like about two weeks between when I started it and when I finished it. There's just this gap. And then I kind of like had to go back and, and reread it. But again, please read the book if you were interested at all in it. American history of anarchism, but particularly like kind of these ethnic, just ethnic radicalism or ethnic anarchism or however you want to call it. Uh, and if you're particularly interested in like the micro history, as it's called in this text, you know, not focusing on the bid names, but understand the rank and file that allowed these bid names to do the work that they did. Okay, this has been Artemis, the Uncivilized podcast. Thank you for listening.